All right. Nothing like a big bore single shot rifle. Remington number one single shot. Let's put a single shot through it at Mr. Single Gong. Oh man, almost in the center. What a rifle. <sighs> Smells good. Uh oh, there's other varmints out here. Oh, yeah, another cowboy. Desperados everywhere. There's one right here. Woo! All right. Single shots are nice, but you got to be prepared. There could be other attackers, right? <laughs> All right, look what we've got here. Hickok 45 with a fine firearm, something that you know I would enjoy, right? Uh, well, I started to say vintage. It's a vintage reproduction. Well, it's a reproduction of a vintage arm. Does any of that make sense? Not really. But this is the rolling block. First time we've had one here on the shooting table and you know i don't know that i have ever fired one i don't think i have until this one so this has been a new experience for me i've handled them i've wanted to uh, get a hold of one just have never been able to do it and uh, this comes by way of uh, a soldier up at fort campbell contacted me said he had this be glad to lend it to us so met him up in clarksville and uh this is his it's a nice r uh, rifle we appreciate uh him lending this to us, okay? In addition to his you know, serving the country for us. So this is a Petersoli, and it's, uh, uh, I guess he got it at Cabela's. It's a, it's a uh, you know, Petersoli rolling block 30 inch, as it says on the side. Okay, and Petersoli makes some of the really nice reproductions. They do a good job. Any of them I've ever seen, they're some of the, uh, I think the best reproductions out there. They usually have really nice wood really nice finish fit and finish and everything so pretty cool pretty cool i'm glad to have it here and we're going to be firing uh, uh some of my hate that so yeah this was uh what i said it was it was the uh remington number one single shot shot but it became known as the rolling block okay because you kind of roll back the block instead of a as opposed to a falling block on a uh, sharps type rifle they developed this thing around the civil war time during the civil war various versions of it there was even a pistol version of it uh you know the the uh receiver and everything looks looks like you just took that and then put a shorter grip on it a pistol grip and shorter barrel and then they expanded into a uh a rifle now, i don't know how long the pistols were actually used i think they were used some for a while but you don't see many of those around i don't think i recall seeing uh, many of those even at, at gun shows but lots of rolling blocks, okay? Pretty cool. Now you ask why I have the sharps on the table, uh, and you've seen this in earlier videos. Uh, the sharps model 18, that's not the 74. That was a later version, and not many of them in this configuration were even made, but, uh, but sharps are sharps, just like rolling blocks are rolling blocks. There were a lot of different configurations of this, a lot of different configurations of the sharps rifle. The most common being the 1874 sharps, I guess. And uh, I was reading that they really only made about 13, 14,000 of those though. For them to be so popular uh, in our minds and in production these days and everything, uh, the Remington rolling block, there were way more of these made. There were over a million of these made as compared with the 74 Sharps, uh, 14,000. I mean, you know, that's like a BB to a basketball. So. While you might not see these in your favorite movie, and that's part of the reason, uh, this gun, these sharps are featured in so many big movies. You know what, Quigley Down Under, you know, uh, name them. It's just used in a lot of westerns, movies, series. You just see it all the time, seems like. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's, uh, it's considered to be cooler. It looks cooler with the lever and the falling block and everything, I don't know. Of course, that one looks cooler because it's uh, it's got that that nice finish. Uh, most of the sharps didn't have all that. They look more like this. I've had a couple of the 1874 models reproductions, and they, they really look kind of like this. They're kind of plain unless you dress them up with something or have nickel plating or whatever you, you might want to do. Uh, so anyway, these things they were prolific, prolific. Uh, Another reason, uh, besides the movies, is that they were not featured in, is just the fact that so many of these went overseas. 
it's just amazing if you read about them. Uh, this gun has been used all around the planet in various formats, links, and everything. Uh, gosh, did I read that? Sweden, Denmark adopted it in, I think, 67. And some of the calibers and cartridges uh, I, I've never even heard of. But around the planet in various chamberings, uh, this was, I think, Sweden's official, this was their military rifle from about 67 to, to 90, mid-90s, 1890s, we're talking here, 1867, 1890s, do I need to tell you that? <laughs> Uh, until they, I think they went with the Swedish Mauser I like so much, you know, the 6.55, the 55. Uh, and, and Denmark, and oh man, where else? Uh, and Mexico, Egypt, uh, Argentina, this, uh, and even the British Navy bought a bunch of these things uh, during World War I, I read. I mean, they're just used all over the place if you read about them. Because they're strong, they're sturdy, they're simple. You didn't have a lot of trouble with them. Uh, generally speaking, they were pretty trouble free. Now they weren't perfect. I think I, I read that uh, sometimes a firing pin could give you a little issue here and there. Some people don't consider them as safe uh, because you notice how you load it. I'll go ahead and shoot it again. Can I shoot it? Thank you. I'm gonna cock it. I'll just go ahead and get my ears on. So if I'm screaming at you, you'll know why. Because you have to cock it and then you pull back the breech block like that. All right. And I think I have a handy dandy around right here in my pocket. So I'll put that in there. You push that forward and it's cocked of course so is a bolt action and a lot of others there's just no other external safety other than keeping your finger off the darn trigger until you're ready to fire okay and i had read that there were some variations of it made where uh some militaries uh, i forgot which ones but uh once you loaded it the hammer would fall to half cock and there were some measures taken uh in some variations of it but as long as you're careful you know you don't load it till you're ready to, ready to shoot the thing you're okay of course you could put a round in and uh, i don't know uh, again i'm not an expert on these but maybe you if you're going to carry it correctly not have it tilted upward i guess you could carry it like that or would that be unsafe i don't know if that'd be a little safer i guess it'd be a little safer yeah because you're not going to hit the firing pin and i noticed on this one i don't know about the originals but the trigger won't pull so i guess that'd be kind of a safety like with the old break action shotguns you know, if you're out hunting rabbits in the field, a lot of people would carry it with the shotgun, the ammo in the shotgun. It's loaded, but it'd be broken in half and just carry it like that. And then if they need to shoot it, put it back together and, and fire. And, I don't know, just, just came to me <laughs> on the fly there. But anyway, that's how it loads. And uh, the rifle was mainly designed to shoot clay pots, like that one right there. See? And then... What you did was you work on your speed load, you grab another one out of your pocket, close her up, and shoot again. <laughs> oh man, they, these are sweet. This one's 4570, did I tell you that? So obviously in a rifle like this, I would want it, as you know, in a caliber like 4570. Something that a classic cartridge uh, and readily available why don't we just shoot something that'll go blow up here? Oh! Wow. Disintegrated <laughs> watermelon. That was funny. That was funny. Uh, yeah, this, this is... Uh, now, when you see these in most cases, if you're at a gun show where there's a lot of old guns, they won't look as good as this. You know, because a lot of these, probably most of them, well, I think that's not a probably. I think most of these were made for militaries around the world and so they're not going to be as nice looking probably no pistol grip i think most of them didn't have the pistol grip this is kind of a sporting model and uh they're going to look of course they're going to be weathered and worn like like most old guns and probably a round barrel instead of the octagonal barrel like this i just have always liked octagonal barrels this is a really nice uh, configuration here uh let me shoot this i'm gonna shoot that uh cinder down there some of that yeah when you got something that's pretty powerful it's fun to take advantage of it for example sometimes those two liters don't puncture very well and this takes care of it how was that it did the job <laughs> let's go for the red plate Ah, 
can't believe it reached out to 75 yards. <laughs> Actually, rifles like this, they're commonly uh, shot at 1,000 yards or competed with. You know, the Sharps uh, especially, that's another reason it's more popular. It was used in the Creedmoor, famous Creedmoor matches that shoot out to 1,000 yards and all that kind of thing. And even today, in most of the long range, black powder cartridge uh, uh, matches, I think the Sharps still reigns. It's the most popular. But there are some people who shoot these. Uh, so, I don't know. They're, they're all cool. They really are. It's a tough decision, you know, between the Sharps, this, and uh, the high wall, you know, which is more fun to shoot. They're all fun. So let's uh, close the breech and shoot another two liter. <laughs> Takes care of it, doesn't it? Let's put another one on that... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a reload now, and I'm going to shoot the gong. That's the nice thing about these, these big 405 grain lead bullets. When, when you hit something out there, you can see it. Wow, you can definitely see the hit, can't you? Let's put another one on that. I got almost a group going on the gong. I better stick with it, hadn't I? <laughs> Move them on down. Yeah, it's really rocking it. Cool. So that is a that is a nice rifle, and you know it feels good. Like I said, these things are rugged. They're strong. You know, even though they were developed in the 1860s uh, and really got going, you know, of course, around the world there in the 1870s, they were used in this country as by the buffalo hunters. Now. They were number two, you know, in the buffalo hunting world. The sharps, I think, were the, the most common. And then these were used a lot as well. And these were used in militaries more so, obviously, than, than the sharps. And, you know, one advantage this gun would have, if you think about it, if uh, you're in combat, as I am quite often on the range here, you know, against all these desperados, chickens, pigs, two liters, and gongs and such. If you're in a prone position, and for you folks in Kentucky, that means lying down. Uh, you know, you don't have that lever uh, to deal with. That's another reason. Boy, talk about a question that everybody asks. Not everybody, but a lot of people ask. Is why weren't the lever guns used more commonly in uh, militaries? Because, wow, you got, even with, uh, you know, the Henry, of course, or the 1873 Winchester, all those great Winchester rifles of the late 19th century, you had... 10, 12, 15, 17 rounds, you know, at your disposal. But, you know, if you're down there trying to keep from getting shot, you're lying in the face down in the dirt, yeah, you got that lever, you know, to operate, which you would have on the sharps, you know, even though it's not a lever gun, it sort of is. On this, you know, you don't. You'd be down there hugging the ground, cock that thing, and slide another round in, and, you know, you know, that gun could just stay right where it is. So that might have been one of the attractions, you know. Also, I read that Remington, they didn't necessarily make a me any of these things. They licensed, you know, the patents and everything out to other countries and uh, it made a lot of their money that way. I, I read that they were in financial uh, problems after the Civil War, canceled contracts and everything when the war ended. And this, this gun pretty much saved them. Uh, they sold so many of them and, and so many, uh, uh, or so much of the licensing, I guess, dollars they got and everything. So. So it's a historic gun, an interesting uh, piece of, of, of history. It really is. And again, they're all not this big and this heavy. When you get the octagonal barrel and uh, target models like this, it can be a little bit heavier. Then again, if you're shooting a powerful round, you might want a little weight. Speaking of power, let's put, we just happened to notice overnight somebody placed a couple of uh, five gallon containers of water on the range. Now one of them has a leak in it, so it's not totally full. And we'll see what happens with it anyway. The squirrels ate into the top of it or something. Oh well, it broke it. Okay, gotta cock it, pull back the breech block. Yeah, I'll get that later. All right, oh, someone filled up a bucket. <laughs> all right <laughs> now the way this works 
you might be looking at this and thinking, uh, that doesn't look like that's much to, uh, you've got that big 4570 round and some of these are in 50. I think it came out originally, maybe it was in 60, so, I don't know, 50, 45, or a lot of different calibers, more than you can keep up with. But that doesn't look like much. How does that hold the, how does that act as a, a, a block, you know? I mean, that seems like a weak little piece of nothing. Well, the way it works is this hammer, the mechanism down here, I could take a hacksaw and cut that out and show you, but the owner wouldn't like that probably. But when you bring that hammer down, it locks that breech. It's not just the spring and the pressure against it. That breech block, it's down in here that blocks it. It can't move once the hammer, because it's got a, a piece down here that it hangs on, hangs up on, that blocks it. And you can't move that. I mean, you couldn't move that, I guess, with a sledge until you broke it all. So it's really tight, doesn't give a bit, okay, until you cock it. So that's what locks that in, okay. Rolling block, it's got a rolling block, pretty cool. I like this rifle. Now, I'll tell you something about this sporting model. This, this particular rifle, uh, I was really prepared for this to be a little awkward, you know, I just, I just was, uh, and not a smooth feeling or shooting, I'm, I'm not sure why, but uh, boy, when I picked it up and shot the first time, I thought, whoa, this thing fits me almost like a glove, it just, it's got the length, you know, so I'm not tempted to stick a, an extender on it, and it, it feels good, uh, that pistol grip and everything. That thing feels like a million bucks, I have to say. It feels better than the, the Sharps in terms of the way it fits me. All right. You know what? It's a buffalo. Well, it's not loaded yet. Get my ears on. It's a buffalo hunting gun, so maybe we ought to, ought to try to kill a buffalo. And like I say, this thing uh, is chambered. Uh, it's been chambered in 303 British, 3040 Crag, of course, a 4570. I think the, Span the uh, Spaniards use this thing in a 43 caliber, something like that. Uh, seven millimeter. Uh, the list of chamberings is you know, as long as your arm. Okay, and you can see why it's a single barrel. Uh, so, you know, it wouldn't be that hard to chamber. It's kind of like a Thompson contender or any single shot. It's a little simpler to chamber in, in different uh, cartridges. So, I'm going to do a little hunting. Okay. Forty-five seventy. Uh, there's a buffalo hanging over. There's one. I'll get the one on the left. <laughs> I missed him. Okay, I know we've got a little bit different point of impact with these two different rounds I'm shooting, but uh, I should be able to hit that guy. There we go. I uh, can't see it. All right, cool. Buffalo, we killed a buffalo. Let's kill a ram. Whew. Looked like a high hit. Or maybe that was another hit. <laughs> There's something really satisfying about a single shot. They're fun. They are fun. There's another ram over there staring at me. Oh, that one went under his neck. Actually, the sights aren't too bad. Uh, if I miss this, it's just because of me or not knowing exactly where to hold. There we go. Yeah, man. That's fun. Big old 4570. Look at that smoke. Cool, huh? There's something for you new shooters. Uh, you might think, okay, I don't want any part of that. That's going to kick like crazy. I have shot a nine millimeter and a nine millimeter kicks me more than I like or something. That thing has got to be punishing. It, it's really not. It's not. It, it you know, it, it doesn't hurt you. It just pushes you, pushes you a little bit. Let's shoot another one. Well, we've got a, uh, a bowling pin. Let's see if it'll roll the bowling pin. <laughs> Definitely moved him off there, didn't it? <laughs> uh, that's cool. Oh, there's another pot down there. Do a little more pot smoking. Uh, went right through it. Can you imagine that? 
I think I'm out of ammo in my, my pocket uh, uh, supply there. We'll put a lead one on him, finish him off. <laughs> Definitely finished him off. <laughs> oh, there's a little bit of cinder over there too. Let's get a couple more here in case we need them. You know, once I get to shooting, I can't stop, even with a single shot. There's no such thing as a single shot, is there? Because I'm going to shoot it multiple times. So it becomes a multiple shot, doesn't it? All right, I'm going to see if I can hit uh, a little of that cinder block or whatever it is over there. I can see the sight well enough. Hey, you know what? Let's pull that back. Make sure my ears are in tight. All right. <laughs> cool. I'll tell you, that is neat. I like this. I like a single shot. Uh, what can I say? Oh, there's a two liter hiding there. I almost didn't see. Oh, takes care of that, doesn't it? Got to put another one on the gong. We'll just get one of these. Did I put one on the red plate? I think I did, but I'm going to put another one on the red plate. I knew it shot too low when I pulled the trigger. With the jacketed rounds, I have to hold a little bit higher. Just like that. All right. That's a beauty. That's a beauty. One of the advantages to a single shot too is it's so simple to get to and to clean. Yep, there's the breach, there's the bore right there. Uh, easy to access from uh, from behind there so you can uh, clean it. Don't have to be ramming rods down the muzzle, you know, which you can uh, kind of scratch the crown, affect accuracy and all that. You're not careful. So, so this is a, a nice rifle. I really appreciate uh, the fellow lending this to us. And, uh, and I don't think he's shot it much, really, yet at all. Hadn't had it long. And uh, it, that's a rifle that he will definitely enjoy because it, it feels really good. And uh, the sight's not too bad. The sight picture is not too bad. It's a little fuzzy. I don't have perfect vision in my right eye. But uh, it's, it's, it's pretty good, too. And uh, seems to shoot right on windage-wise. And you just have to, as with any firearm, you uh, kind of want to decide what ammo you're going to shoot mostly in it or what you want to sight it in for. If you know you're going to be shooting, say, this round, most of the time, or 300 grain jacketed uh, bullet most of the time, that's what you want to set your sights for. If, uh, like, this one shoots a little bit lower than the 405 grain for me. So, I think for anybody, because it, it does. Uh, so, you know, I would need to decide if I'm just going to shoot this one. I would need to change my sights a little bit. Since it shoots a little low at distance with that one, I would want to raise my rear sight up a notch or two there, and that would put it right on. See? So, Or, you know, as you become more proficient, you might learn and realize that, okay, when I'm shooting this ammo, if I put my rear sight up two more notches, it's right on. It hits the same place this does. And then when I'm shooting the other ammo, I move it back down, mark your notches or whatever you want to do there, right? Take a picture of it with your... Uh, camera phone you know like that's what they did back during the civil war and just kind of got a good good reading on that and that way they could just pull out their phone oh yeah let me change my sights to there cool gun uh i can't think of anything else that uh i don't know about it uh i, I do some reading on these old guns the the sharps uh we've done videos on the sharps and i try to give you the basics uh and uh, some of you may not have even been familiar with the rolling block rifle period and uh Again, that's part of the reason we love to do these, kind of bring something to you that's that was pretty prominent in history that maybe you didn't even know about. Because if you just watch the movies, um, if that's where all your firearms information comes from, most of it, you really legitimately might not have even seen this firearm before, uh, where it was pretty common, pretty common, even in this country. Even though a lot of the, the sales and the manufacturing was done overseas, uh, 
it, it, quite a few of them were used here. And again, it was probably probably number two to the sharps, you know, in terms of big bore single shot rifles in the buffalo hunting era of the 1870s. I guess that kind of started after the Civil War and then on up into the late 70s. By 1880, I think the, the buffalo herds were almost decimated. They were, they were pretty much, again, folks in Kentucky, they were pretty much gone by then. So, uh, and, and I think now today there are more buffalo bison, you know, in this country, American bison, than there were in like 1885, 1890, you know, there, cause they were virtually gone. So pretty interesting rifle. Uh, again, I oh, forgot to mention, that's why we got this, this hide out. This is old Buffalo, Buffalo hide. We bring it out every now and then. And we thought, wow, today might be the day to bring it out. They even got a little, uh, watermelon right there. I wonder where that came from. Somebody's been using it for a tablecloth, right? I guess that's what we use it for. So, uh, and, and again, I think I mentioned when the smokeless loads came out, the smokeless powder loads came out in the, oh, what, 1890, 18, late 1880s uh, and 1890s especially. You know, this rifle was ready for that because it was a very strong, sturdy gun. So I don't think they had to change a lot. It, you know, it would handle the, the smokeless powder. So, uh, nice rifle. Uh, now, a lot of people shoot black powder in these old single shots. There's a big sport of doing that. I do it myself sometimes. But it's nice to know you can shoot either either type of uh, you know rounds and powder. You just go to any gun store that has the cartridges for it, and you can buy them and shoot them. So it's pretty neat. I'm really glad to be able to, to bring this to you. It's a pretty gun. Look at that piece of wood. Life is good. Oh, since I'm still here, let me thank SDI for all their help. SDI is a fully accredited online gunsmithing school. Check them out at sdi.edu. We'd also like to thank Bud's Gun Shop and Federal Premium for all of their support. You can find us on Full 30 also now, and you can find the links to our Facebook pages and the other YouTube pages in the description of any video. So I invite you to check out the description in every video or any video, you'll find what you need to know and you'd better do it.